So this is the Kingdom of Heaven, part one. This will be a three-part series that will each cover different aspects of the kingdom. But why? I want to present the Kingdom of Heaven to you in a way that you've probably never heard it before. Like, for real. And with this first video, I want to lay a foundation to uncover the storyline of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So let's go back. God speaks the universe into existence. Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. It even says in Job 38 that as God laid the foundations of the earth, that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In day two, God separates the waters from the waters and creates the skies. In day three, God causes the dry land to emerge and commands the earth to sprout vegetation. And we see in the first three days that God makes these spaces habitable, the skies, the waters, and the land, and then he fills them. Within these realms, God makes heavenly rulers and earthly rulers, even delegating his power, allowing them to make creative decisions, utilizing their great gift of free will. But with the freedom of choice came a freedom to rebel, and their desire to rule themselves sparked a series of three falls, a couple of them even being connected. And this becomes clear in the text of the first two falls, Genesis 3 and 6. In chapter 3, the Bible says that the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that she took of its fruit and ate. This is the same formula in chapter 6, where the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. The Hebrew word is tov, the same in Genesis 3. And they took the wives any they chose, right? So it's the same formula saw, good, took. And so their sin brought their exile from God's dwelling place on earth, the Garden of Delight, AKA Eden. Leading us to yet another fall, Genesis 11, Babel. Babel was a kingdom uniting to rule apart from God. It's man elevating his own name, and so in response, God confuses their languages and scatters them across the land. But God, incessant on partnering with mankind, immediately calls a man named Abraham. It's no coincidence why the call of Abraham directly follows the Babel story. Notice how God wants to elevate a nobody and make him a name directly after mankind seeks to make a name for himself. Deuteronomy 32 describes this event as when God gives the nations up to these principalities, to these spiritual rulers, while simultaneously committing himself to his people, his portion, Jacob, which were Abraham's descendants. And so this begs the question, what about everybody else? Well, if you remember the initial call, God promises Abraham that it'd be through him and his descendants that he would bless all nations. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, so, so pretty much everybody's going to get a blessing. No, but for real, what we see is from the moment of man's fall, God already had a redemptive plan to reconcile all nations, all of humanity back unto himself. But now the question is how? Okay, well, Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob's descendants became the nation of Israel. And so, all throughout the Bible, God's relationship with Israel is often depicted as a marriage. This is why in Ezekiel 16, God says, I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. God and Israel pledged to love and to be loyal to one another. And this came in the form of the Old Testament law. This can be thought of like the vows in a marriage between a husband and a wife. Embedded in this law, this radical new way of life was a sacrificial system that God gave man so that they can maintain purity and holiness. And this was the tabernacle. This was God's heart since the beginning. God had to make the tabernacle just so that, as he says in Exodus 25, that he may dwell in their midst, just to dwell with mankind. So Israel settles in the promised land. The nation grows and many years pass. Then comes along a beloved warrior, a man who becomes king named David. David's heart is revealed in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In this chapter, David wants to upgrade God's house from a tabernacle, which is like a tent, to a temple, a permanent dwelling place in Jerusalem. And God, moved by this, tells David, I know you want to make me a house, but instead, I'm going to make you a house. And he even extends the blessing to Abraham, as I have highlighted here in yellow. He tells him, I'm going to make you a great name. It's the same promise, but it's narrowed down now to King David. And God tells him that you are going to have a son, a descendant, who's going to build me a house, and I will establish his kingdom forever. And David's son does build God a house. His name was Solomon. But Solomon was a flawed man and failed to meet a lot of the messianic criteria. So the Israelites knew that there was still a coming son of David who was supposed to rule. But this grace period was short-lived. As Israel repeatedly cheated on God and worshipped idols. And this led to their fall. Their temple was destroyed and they were exiled from their land. But of course, none of this was without hope. While they were in exile, God had already promised that he would return a remnant. But he acknowledges their human nature, their inability to do right, and promises that there would come a time where he's going to put his spirit within them so that they will be able to keep his commandments. And thus, concluding the Hebrew Bible, now, every scripture that I gave you all here was from the Hebrew Bible, right, which is the Old Testament. And I at least gave you all the gist of it. I, I did leave out a lot. I left out the flood, the exodus, uh, the splitting of the kingdom, right, the northern kingdom being Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. I left a lot out on purpose because I can't fit all of it in there. And those are all important, but just this is at least the gist of it, right? And where I left off is when they're in exile, right? Babylon exiles. It's actually the southern tribe or the southern kingdom of Judah. And God promises that he's going to bring them back, right? And you see that in Jeremiah 29. He's going to leave them there for 70 years, bring them back, right? Just the remnant. And that is what he does, right? Judah, right? They do come back. They do rebuild the temple, but it's nothing like it used to be. Um, you see this in Ezra and then in, again in Haggai that they make the temple but it's not as glorious as solomon's temple was right the first one and for the most part i mean that's pretty much the last eventful thing that happens in the hebrew bible right 
uh, there is still Nehemiah. The last book chronologically is Malachi, but it's not very eventful. It's all still, still looking ahead, right? And that's the end. And so it kind of leaves you hanging. It leaves you wondering, what about this 2 Samuel 7 prophecy? What about this son of David that's supposed to right, set up a kingdom that's going to reign forever? It's going to last forever. Where's that guy at? Where's this Messiah? Where he at, right? And these are the questions that you're supposed to ask. And this leads us into the New Testament. Matthew 1 starts with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and son of Abraham, proving that he has a right to the throne. In John's Gospel, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 says, And the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. God incarnate. Let's go even deeper. In John 1, 14, the word for dwell, the Greek word skenao, is literally the word for tabernacle. So the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So Jesus was God with us, God dwelling on earth. And so Jesus preached the gospel. The gospel was the arrival of God's kingdom. And so the kingdom of God had finally arrived, and it was in Jesus. His followers rejoiced until God's temple was destroyed. Jesus was crucified. With Jesus' death, the forces of darkness had believed that they had won. It was yet another twin rebellion. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against man, but against evil rulers, principalities in high places. It was spiritual evils playing out yet again in the physical. But these cosmic powers were ignorant of God's ability to turn evil into good. And on the third day, Jesus resurrected. The Spirit of God had given breath to Jesus' lifeless body. And he stayed around for about 40 more days, and then he ascended into heaven. But of course, not without hope. And this leads us to Acts chapter 2. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls mightily on the disciples, and they're able to speak in other tongues by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jews from every nation are visiting and hear their own language and are bewildered, even thinking that the disciples are drunk. And so this should sound familiar. Pentecost is literally a reversal of the Tower of Babel. But here at Pentecost, God turns many languages to one, and instead of disinheriting people, He's building His family, bringing back a scattered people. And to become a part of this family, all we have to do is just believe on His Son, Jesus, our sacrificial lamb. And it is by grace that we are saved and not by works so that nobody can boast before God. And now the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives within us, the body of believers. And we are God's temple. The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. We are literally the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Yet this is only a mere shadow of what is to come. Leading us to Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul compares the relationship between a man and a wife in marriage to Jesus and his church, his bride, which is us. Paul literally quotes Genesis 2 where it says a man and a wife cling together and become one flesh and says that it refers to Jesus and his church. And I think this means two things, that when we believe and when he puts his spirit within us, it's a two becoming one. And to save time, 
I'm just going to use a clip from one of my sermons. Right? And that's what it is. His spirit living within me is the two becoming one. And that's how I would interpret that, right? And that's an intimate knowing each other, right? But also, it could also mean, and I think, it's, I think this is also right, ultimately, right, what it will be. And that's why I have John right here is, uh, right, let's say at the beginning, right, heaven and then earth, right? Heaven and earth, where they met was Eden, right? It's where God and earth, that's where they meet. Right? Our space and then God's space where they become one. And at the beginning, right, it was Eden. But after they lost that, right, God dwelled with man in the form of a temple. And that's what the physical temples were, these big buildings. It was where God dwelled with people. Right? It was where God dwelled here on earth. And even Jesus, he called himself a temple because he was where God dwelled on earth, where God dwelled with us. Right? And then fast forward to now. We are now temples, right? We are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. And so how does God dwell on earth today? It's in us. It's through us. And so like we are like these little pockets of heaven. This is me, you, whoever. We're all temples, right? And it's how God dwells here on earth. But ultimately, right, with the two fully becoming one, like he talks in Ephesians 5, heaven is going to come down fully, right? When God makes all things right, brings judgment on the day of the Lord, heaven and earth will fully become one. Right? And that's why in Revelation it's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. Right? It's a wedding. It's a marriage. It's a union of the two. Right? Of God's and man. Right? God's place and earth just meeting together. Right? A union. And so... Um, so in conclusion, we see that God literally made us just to dwell with Him. This is the unified theme and story from Genesis to Revelation. And now God does give us assignments and work. And we'll get to that in part two. But just know that everything else is secondary.